I V M. Hey, welcome to Shunya One, episode forty-five with Sanket Nadani today, and we're gonna go talk about uh, stuff about SaaS products and the cool stuff he's building at Wingify, and of course uh, how the scene is uh, building SaaS products in Pune or in Bangalore and selling across <laughs> the world. So it should be an interesting conversation. You know, I think people people can hear your smirk when you say Pune and Bangalore now. Let's let's <laughs> let's find out once we get started. Uh, but before that, Amit, how's uh, the response been to another SaaS product which um, we discussed last week? Yeah, it was an interesting episode. I mean, like I think uh, generally the response people have had has been pretty positive. Uh, but uh, this, today, instead of talking about the response to the episode, I thought I'd uh, tell people that hey, you know, introduce yourself on the Slack channel so that we can uh, we know who's there. Uh, we were uh, so we. Recently Recently, got joined by uh, Ore, Ore, O R E. I guess that's his real name or something. But he wanted to introduce himself. He's a student from Baltimore, and uh, he has been enjoying the show. And he's a new guy at programming. But uh, you talk to him. You can talk to everybody else. Join on the Slack channel, which you can get to by going to the website, ivmpodcast.com/shunya1, and over there, click the Join the Slack channel. Awesome! So it's great to know we have some global listeners. Yes, now. we do. Baltimore, Maryland. Superb. Onwards with the show then. Hey, so today we are talking to Sanket Nadani, who's the director of new products at Wingify. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, glad to be here. Yes, and uh, you've had, of course, uh, quite an experience building and uh, working on SaaS products for a while now, uh, much longer than I have now, uh, just being on the business side of SaaS. We'd love to hear about what you've been doing, uh, your experiences uh, in Fusion Charts and Wingify now, and the new stuff you've been building. Sure. So I'll, I'll actually go a little back and like you know talk about how I got into Fusion Charts because it's a little different from like you know your regular job stint or regular stint that people have. So I think I think it all started back when um, you know moved to Calcutta from Bihar, and my dad had a web development company. And me and my brother, like, you know, my dad would bring clients in and me and my brother would sit down and, like, you know, actually code those websites that, you know, he would get clients for. And uh, that is how, like, you know, we started learning how to, you know, make websites. My brother got better at programming and he learned, you know, how to actually, like, you know, he learned ASP and, you know, some other programming languages. And he got much better at that than I did. And um, so after that, like, you know, he went on to, you know, uh, write an article talking about, you know, how you can make animated charts. And he did it for the pocket money because there was some website back in the day which was really happy to, you know, pay $150, $200, something which was a very, very good amount, you know, for a, I don't know how old were we then, 14, I think he was 14, I was Yeah, man, you guys started (laughs) with, you guys have been like... The the bootstrap poster boys of uh, 2014, (laughs) yeah, I would have to say so. Yeah, yeah. So he he wrote that article, and um, developers really liked it. Like, you know, they really liked the idea of you know being able to use animated and interactive flash charts. Because till that time, like, you know, whenever they had to use charts or any kind of data visualization within their web application, it was always very very boring. You know, you remember the Excel charts back in the day. So that is how charts looked like, you know, on the web back in the day. So it was also is... really expensive. I remember, I mean, like uh, back then I used to run a web development company and we had to buy like some controls from somewhere for doing these charts and they were crazy expensive, <laughs> like tens of thousands of dollars expensive. So, wow. yeah. So Yeah, okay. Yeah, we were, we were definitely selling it much cheaper, way, way cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the article kind of picked up and like, you know, that's when we figured out, okay, you know what, maybe there's something here. And yeah, that's when that's when my brother, like, you know, Pallav, he went on to actually write the first version of Fusion Charts. And yeah, it was not that competitive back then. Like, you know, you didn't have to do like, you know, 100 million different things to like, you know, get 100 customers. You did a couple of things and there were like, you know, 100, 200 users or customers coming in. So yeah, he, he put that out and I was still going to school. I was, my memory is a little hazy. I don't know if I was in 9th, 10th, 11th, whatever it was. So my memory is a little easy, but I was going to school and after that, like, you know, I'd come back and help with whatever I could. So, like, you know, I'd build the website, build some demos, help with support and things like that. So I did that. Uh, so because, you know, Fusion Charts was founded in the same bedroom that, you know, <laughs> that yeah. I, I slept in. So I helped with whatever I could. And I did this, like, you know, with whatever free time I had. And then after that, I went to college. And yeah, the college that I went to, like, you know, there was no internet connection in the hostel. So for the first year, I was completely disconnected. But like, you know, in the third and the fourth year, once I kind of moved out, I had an internet connection. So I, you know, I again got back to helping out with whatever I could. And then once I got done with college, I had a couple of job offers from a couple of different places. 
and i went to college in bangalore and like you know all of this was in calcutta and bangalore was like such a refreshing experience from like you know calcutta it was a lot mm-hmm. more fun i was staying by myself so yeah it was it was good fun i didn't want to go back to calcutta right but yeah people have convinced me that you know okay come back and like you know hey we have we have this good thing going we'll grow it and i'm like okay fine <laughs> went back to calcutta uh work was good work was good so you know that's when like you know started focusing full time on marketing as opposed to you know just building the website or doing whatever i could so i started focusing full time on marketing because the market had also gotten a little competitive by then there were a couple of players so like you know we'd have to do some more seo would have to have like a very good website we'd have to have like very good demos and things like that so i started focusing on marketing and then later like you know once we realized that okay you know what we have to kind of sell i mean till that time whatever sales we were getting all of that was inbound people would come try it out we had like great demos we had a great free trial we had great documentation support so people would come in by themselves try it out and you know go ahead and buy it but then once we you know we we realized that okay you know what there are some people who have some questions and you know they want to get on a sales call and these people are willing to pay like a lot more money as opposed to the couple of 100 dollars that we are charging you know these guys can pay us a couple of 1000 dollars right and that's when like you know we kind of started understanding the importance of a sales team because again this is back in the day this is i don't know i'm talking about 2009 10 Yeah. Yeah, so you didn't have like you know all of this literature that you have today about you know how to do a startup, how to you know set up your sales team. All of these things I mean even if they were like you know it was very limited. Yeah, it was more value focused anyway. There was no especially no one in Calcutta probably doing uh, selling SaaS like you guys, right? So <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that was that was another another thing like you know in Calcutta we we yeah, did not really find like you know too many people we could kind of go to for advice. So we'd go to like you know Bangalore for events, and we'd be like you know kind of mind blown. Oh, there are people who understand what we are talking about. Oh, there are people who get it because in Calcutta we'd go around and like you know we'd talk to people, and they'll be like, hmm, okay, huh? You guys are doing something in IT. That is the best. <laughs> maybe maybe we're meeting the wrong kind of people, but yeah, we did not get like you know a lot of advice and stuff. So yeah, so then um, yeah, once we realized okay, hey, we could have a sales team and stuff. So I also set up the sales team. So yeah, marketing and sales was what I focused on, and then I think two or three years into it, you know, I kind of got tired because I mean I was working very very hard. I was working fifteen sixteen hours a day, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I can take a sabbatical for a year. Mm-hmm. So then I took a year off, you know, went around traveling and stuff because that's something I always wanted to do. I always thought like you know I had this creative side to me, or like you know I wanted to travel. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to try this out. So just before we did that, like you know, I somehow convinced my brother that okay, you know what, we should also open an office in Bangalore because that's where like you know the smart talent is, that's where like you know the energy is good. Of course, my hidden agenda was also the fact that you know I really liked it. You rather in. live in Bangalore than Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pubs there were nicer. They played good music. I don't know. Some of some of fit in much better over there. Right. So that happened. I helped setting up the Bangalore office, and right after that, I took off for a year or year and a half. I went traveling around the country. That was that was great fun. Um, I think I think I learned a lot from that as well. I mean, that, there's, there's so much you can learn from, like you know, working in companies, reading books, talking to people. But I think yeah, even even traveling, like you know, kind of taught me a lot. And then I went back again, and by the time I got back, Fusion Charts had obviously matured a little more. So there was like a much more seasoned person to take care of sales. So I came back and I started focusing on marketing, and also the market had gotten even more competitive because you know we are building a developer product. and a bunch of guys had like you know come out with like you know open source alternatives to it and it give developers open source alternatives to it they're not yeah. <laughs> they're not <laughs> going to pay you money so we had to you know really start you know differentiating ourselves like you know become a lot more enterprise grade change our messaging change the way we go to market so i spent a lot of my time and energy on that i did that for another i don't know one and a half two years mm-hmm. and then after that like you know i again took a short break i was trying to figure out you know what else can i do because i had been with vision charts part time or full time for about a decade okay. and i wanted to see like you know how other companies are run i wanted to see how other people solve problems and yeah that's when that's when wingify happened you know paras the founder of wingify wrote an email to me asking hey what's up i'm like okay i'm not really up to much i'm trying to figure out what next and yeah we started talking and like you know it seemed like a great fit so yeah off i went to delhi <laughs> and what did you see at Wingify? Like, what did you find interesting with what they were doing, and versus what you were doing before? So, Wingify was uh, one; it was growing fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, second, it was in marketing software. So, like, you know, I mean, I did marketing. That's a domain I understood much better than you know I understood developers, or like, you know, than I understood you know what what developers want or their psyche and things like that. So, I thought I could make use of my skills much better. 
at at Wingify. So there was that uh, the market opportunity seemed larger. And of course, they are a like like you said, marketing focused uh, platform, right? So it sells to a different set of people, right, uh, within the company. Uh, instead of selling to the dev side, you sell to the uh, the revenue side, and that's something which has been sort of a, a great space for SaaS mm. to be in. Like, be able to sell to the revenue side of the team means right. willingness to pay is a little more than the developer who's always looking for the open source alternative. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so that that definitely played a part. Like you know, that is why I said like you know the opportunity seemed larger. People were talking a lot more about you know things like this. And even the way you go to market over there was very different from like, you know, the way you would go to market, you know, with developers. Mm -hmm. With developers, it's about, you know, they'll probably search for it. They would ask their friends that hang out in developer forums, give them great documentation, give them great support, give them great demos, get them started quickly, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I just thought like, you know, I mean, there was more that I could do, like um, more skills that I had than, you know, what what was being used over there. So like, you know, I would love to like design a great onboarding. I love to... I mean, so Fusion Shots was not SaaS, SaaS in that sense of the word. It was this, a utility. Or it was tool. a developer library that you yeah. download. And SaaS was something like, you know, that had caught my fascination by then. I wanted to, you know, make these web apps and, you know, build great onboardings and, and things like that. So, yeah, I, I joined Wingify and I had to move to Delhi for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that took some convincing. I mean, yeah. Delhi is not exactly <laughs> the kind of city that I see myself fitting into. But Wingify was like, you know, too good an opportunity to, you know, just pass up. So I joined, I joined Wingify, I mean, and I joined it with a very, very fuzzy title called Growth because, I mean, I wanted to join Wingify, Paris wanted to have me on board and yeah, then, like, all right, what exactly am I going to be doing? All right, you know what, how about the title Growth? Just figure out, you know, what can you help us <laughs> do? <laughs> we have spoken about Growth yes. on this show before yes. and we agree that it is as fuzzy as titles can get. Uh, but yeah, so how, so, Oh, obviously, you st- uh, Wingify uh, at that point and even today has had some flagship stuff, right? Uh, which was working really well for them and continues to do so. Uh, but you focused, I think, on the new uh, line of products or is that what you arrived at now? Uh, how's it been uh, so far? So the first six, seven months, I was focused on the flagship product, which is called VWO, Visual Website Optimizer. That is what we used to call it back in the day, but typing visual optimizer, website optimizer.com <laughs> is very long. So we bought the domain VWO.com for a substantial amount of money, uh, three, four, five years back. Wow. I, I didn't actually know that. You VWO. bought VWO.com, a three-letter domain. Uh, yeah, three-letter domain. Holy crap. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's got to have been expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Won't ask you how much, but it's got to have been expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, VW, VW is an EV testing tool. And that's what I, that's our flagship product. That's how Wingify started. So that's what I was focused on initially. And when I joined, I was trying to figure out, you know, what are the main barriers to our growth? So I spent some time, you know, understanding like, you know, what, what, what the constraints were, what is, you know, the growth most constrained by, and initially, it seemed like, you know, our churn rate was kind of high. Mm-hmm. And that's what I focused on. And then to figure out, like, you know, why was that happening? Then I, you know, kind of created some personas trying to understand why people buy from us and things like that. And by then, um, what had also happened was that, like, you know, we'd also hired a bunch of other people. So, like, you know, I mean, somehow our responsibilities were kind of overlapping. And then I was like, all right, you know, what? if the, there are people who are already taking care of these things, maybe I can do something else. Right. And by that time, like, you know, Wingify was in a good place. Like, you know, we had people resources, money, mental bandwidth to be able to, you know, explore new kind of things. And that's where my journey at Wingify with like, you know, all new kinds of products started. So we have built up, built all kinds of new products in the last two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. Started off right from, you know, another SaaS product for mobile marketing automation, which is kind of like, you know, what (laughs) what your your company does now. Uh, To consumer products, to like, you know, none of these worked out, which is why like, you know, we had to keep moving on. Uh, (laughs) And now we're back again, like, you know, to what we're good at, which is making SaaS marketing products. Nice. So what are some of the products that you worked on that you decided to shelve? Like, oh, there's I mean, a lot of them. Yeah. So, I mean, like, give a couple of examples and, like, you know, what, were the, yeah, yeah, because, what were the reasons for shelving? So uh, the first new product that we worked on was uh, a mobile marketing automation product. Mm-hmm. And this is about three years back. Mobile was still hot back then. Uh, people were still making apps, like, you know, hoping to become the next big thing. Right. hmm and we thought like, you know, hey, okay, you know what, maybe we do not know how to make consumer apps. You know, we understand things as a marketing vendors. So mobile marketing automation sounded like, you know, the perfect fit to us. Mm-hmm. 
and we looked at like you know the competition out there and most of the other people were focused on enterprises like hey, there are three million apps out there 1.5 million app developers and people are just focused on like you know those thousand two thousand enterprise apps out there right someone's got to do something for like you know these 1.5 million other people so we got into that space i mean yeah it was a big mistake that we'd realize later on okay. we thought like you know hey we're going to make a simple product and also you know like all these in app pop ups and notifications and things like that like you know i mean it just seemed like you know there had to be a better way to communicate mm-hmm. between an app and the user so we thought like you know we'll come up with like a new kind of communication channel which is kind of embedded within the product itself so mm-hmm. a couple of these things combined we thought we'll enter the space um yeah we we built that we also decided to outsource it to an agency not something you're good at uh, you're not good at micromanagement and i think like you know if you're working with an agency you have to be you kind of to. you know good with yeah. <laughs> micromanagement yeah and you have to be a real like <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say a uh, horrible person. Yeah, you have to. It's like, why is this not done? When is this happening? What is going on? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, like you know, and then we realized, hey, you know what? All these 1.5 million app developers who are making apps, okay, they're doing it in the free time. They do not have any money. They're doing it as, okay, let me just try something. If it works out, great. Right. If it doesn't right. work out, I'm gonna move on to the next thing. So yeah, it didn't seem like you know, I mean, there was any space over there. By that time, we had also decided, just like I convinced my brother to move from Calcutta to Bangalore. I think I convinced Bara, so maybe he already had that going in the back of his head. I convinced uh, Wingify to open an office somewhere apart from Delhi because I didn't like Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> Bangalore was an option. Pune was an option. Uh, we picked Pune. Okay. And so when we moved to Pune, like you know, it was a new place for us. And we're like, okay, what do we do here? We didn't have friends over there. So we're like, all right, you know what? It's hard to find, like you know, what to do after work. Okay, how about how about an events app? How do we get into the like you know the consumer side of things? Right. And it's almost like that to do app of the mobile world, an events uh-huh. app. So we okay. built an events app. Oh, was, what was that called? It was called Firi. It uh-huh. was mostly like you know a couple of hundred people in Pune had it. Ah. Uh, we didn't. We didn't. I mean, it was not working out. So we decided there's no point spending more money and getting it out to more people, only to realize that okay, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So what we did was like you know when people want to hang out, like you know they'll probably go to events, they'll probably watch movies, they'll probably go to restaurants. You know how about bringing all of these things together? And there are also other things that people do. Why do you have to go to like you know two, three, four different apps to you know to be able mm-hmm. to do all of that? So we decided to bring all of that within one single app. And the way you would. do it as like you know it also had like a tender kind of interface so like you know we'll show you everything if you like it you'll shortlist it by swiping right left right yeah <laughs> whatever yeah <laughs> what you said man yeah so yeah you can you could shortlist all of that and then later on you would have like the shortlist so like you know today you want to go out and you have the shortlist of like you know things that you have liked before oh, okay that's interesting yeah yeah see it is it is interesting, is interesting. i have tried to build this in my last two startups <laughs> and it's not worked out so i think i even bought a domain called like like make a plan or plan banao or some shit like that but anyway right. yeah. Yeah, yeah so the whole point of these consumer so i i've struggled with consumer apps myself right so you think you have a great idea and you think this is how people want to use it uh but it just doesn't move beyond the early adopters yeah so so i mean this is we didn't build the app first thing like you no know, so i mean the reason we were so convinced about this and spent like you know 4 5 months is because we did like a whatsapp pilot of this thing mm-hmm. so we were in this part of pune called korega park which is a lot of fun which is where i stay now which is where all the cool things happen so we would send out like you know so we acquired like couple of hundred people and we'd send them like you know five events five cool events happening every day over mm-hmm. whatsapp and that would great like you know people would ask us like you know one of these days we would be like all right just to see how important this is how much people wanted one day we decide not to send it and like you know we'll get like a lot of people asking mm-hmm. here where's my update what's happening today oh. and there'd be people asking us a b testing <laughs> <laughs> and there'd be people asking us hey uh, i'm taking this girl out what would you recommend it's my anniversary where can i go and stuff like that and we're like oh, okay you know what there's something over here. and right. then we took that and then we built the app that i talked about and then it didn't work out like you know we stopped using it after a couple of weeks yeah. and then we realized okay you know the reason for that is because what we built was very different from what we had validated whatsapp is such an integral part of people's right. lives we sell we are sending people a curated list of five events which is very simple right because you don't have to go to a facebook and a bunch of other mm, places right. see 20 different things and figure out what's good so what we validated was different from you know, what we ended up building and it was also a lot of effort nobody wants to go through 20 30 different things shortlist right. them go to your shortlist again so that's a events app that we built 
and then we're like all right you know what maybe they just took a lot more effort like you know hey let's build a simpler events app because <laughs> we still don't know where to go right like you know we still don't know what to do after work so we decided to build this thing called after 5 because you know you work 9 to 5 and at 5 when you're trying to figure out you know where do i want to go which app are you going to turn to after 5 uh, oh man yeah. so it's just a simple list of you know events here's what's happening after 5 in the city because he hey, cool events happen in the city after 5 before that it's like sap training and <laughs> yes <laughs> things things like that so we built that that was actually pretty useful and like you know we said okay you know what hey, instead of just pune like you know we're going to launch it to the world and we did that but later on we realized that like you know the use case it was solving for was like you know very very niche that you know after 5 when you do not know where to go it doesn't really work yeah. that way and worldwide like you know the competition was also a lot more than we right. we kind of you know thought about so and again it was kind of different like you know because in berlin there would be a different set of apps london would have a different set of apps and that's something only when we started like you know doing aso or trying to figure out you know how to get this app out in these cities that's when we figured out the competition was too much so it's still something we kept on for about a year or something just because personally we liked using it yeah so that's the next thing we built then we moved on to messaging because messaging was also kind of hot back then okay and wow there's a whole bunch of yeah. stuff in the consumer <laughs> space <laughs> but but this lot. is the reality right this is the reality of uh, trying out these sort of ideas when you're in a certain zone you feel i have a problem uh the next 100 people around me also have the same problem i hypothesize i solve it and i think that okay fine if me and 100 people have it i'm sure a million people have it somewhere but it doesn't scale it yeah it just doesn't scale uh, so simply uh whereas on the b2b side right i mean i think you're back on the b2b side right so on the b2b side it's more i mean are the problems more homogeneous or what's the difference you think now that you've done both for a substantial amount of time i think on the consumer side like you no know, one like you know just it's more of a winner take all market whereas b2b can be slightly more long tail uh-huh. just because like you know consumers are like hey what are my friends using what have i heard over and over like you know what is a good brand and you know that's what most people stick to versus in b2b it's a slightly more or maybe a lot more rational decision so you're thinking okay what do i need in a product look at like you know four five alternatives and kind of evaluate it a lot more rationally than you would be like you know with a b2c product where you're the only decision maker and and we spent like what 2 seconds 5 seconds yeah and also a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve with the consumer world were a lot more emotional problems and the problems that we solve with b2b products is a lot more functional hey i want to increase my sales here i want to convert my visitors better so that's a functional problem like you know you're coming to work every day and this is something that you're going to solve mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. and emotional problems like you know just very people are just very finicky and it's hard it's really hard you have to understand human emotions at such a in depth level I don't know. I don't know how to solve emotional problems, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think engineers are generally bad. <laughs> We're, uh, I mean, gen- engineers and product. I mean, depends on what kind of product people uh, person you are. But yeah, it is. It's going into that sort of uh, depth of solving emotional problems is a whole different art yeah. of uh, UX. And we've had uh, we've had some conversations around that. uh but interesting i mean i think uh, i want to definitely get into uh, some of the cool stuff uh, you're building today and uh, go deeper on the b2b side of saas which is the fun side which makes money for everyone <laughs> uh but we're going to take a quick break uh, come back and talk some more hi i'm ambika i'm hoshna over the last couple of years during our travels across india we've had the privilege to meet and interact with a number of passionate people who are involved in preservation or conservation of a local heritage art form or culture or even environment and wildlife so in this season we shine a light on some of these individuals and organizations and the work they are doing many of whom are using travel as a means to give back to their communities by showcasing these wonderful people and bringing their work to a larger audience it's our small way of aiding their effort and giving you an opportunity to be part of a unique travel experience new episodes of the rediscovery podcast out every monday on ivm podcast Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're talking with Sanket here about some really interesting uh, consumer products uh, you guys have been building and how those gave you the learnings you had. Why don't you uh, continue with what you were telling us? Oh yeah. So after after building two events apps and shutting them down, you know, actually, actually, one of the when when we're building the first event app, at the same time, like you know, because we had like a couple of different teams, we also trying a messaging app, mm-hmm. actually more like a content app. 
I mean, now that I think about it, like, you know, I'm actually a little confused. Are you? What, was what? this on <laughs> Messenger, like Facebook Messenger messaging or oh, no, no, like no. WhatsApp We messaging? were trying to be the WeChat of India. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. <laughs> bold, bold visions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, one of the other things that we realized was, you know, hey, there are so many Indians. I think we got a number of about 500 million Indians are going to come online in the next three, four, five years. Mm-hmm. Something uh, like that. That's yeah, Google great. keeps yes. changing that every year. <laughs> I know we have 300 today. Right. And, Do we have uh, 300 today? I thought we had 500 today. Post Geo, we have 300 today is what really? I know. I mean, I... Uh, I, I it, so this number keeps changing, right? I mean, I, 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 I remember reading in the Mary it's Mika report, it was 500. It's not 500. No? Okay. I'm pretty sure it's not 500. Yeah, I don't think it's 500. We would not have built Maybe it's 500 connections. <laughs> yeah, probably. But yeah, please. Yeah. So, um... So yeah, I mean, 500 millions are going to be online by, I forget the date now. 2020, just 2020, say. okay, 2020, <laughs> Mary Maker Internet Report. And um, yeah, and when, when they're going to come online and like, you know, like there's only a certain percentage of them, I think about 10% of them, or 10% of them who speak English and the rest of them, when they come online, you know, hey, they are going to want content, they're going to want services in their regional language. Yes. And that's something that we already see happening on WhatsApp, right? You know, mm-hmm. people are still typing in the regional uh, language, but in English right now. So it's kind of like, you know, what they call Winglish. But yeah, when they come online, like, you know, just like we have our content on Twitters and the Facebooks of the world, and a lot of that is in English. Uh, mm-hmm. What what content are they going to consume? So we thought, okay, you know what, they are going to need, you know, news and jokes and, and memes and, right. you know, things like that in the regional language. And uh, to test that again, like, you know, we did like a WhatsApp pilot where we, we had this character called Kabar mm-hmm. and we acquired, I think, a couple of thousand users in Meerut, which is a yeah. small city, I would say. Right. Yeah. And over there, like, you know, we'd, we'd get ourselves added to WhatsApp groups and like, you know, we'd send jokes and people would go, ha ha ha. And then later on in the evening, they'd be like, hey, Kabar joke pata. <laughs> and we'd like, you know, send them more jokes and send wow. them celebrity Gab- gossip. Yeah. Kabar has fallen from his pedestal. <laughs> 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 so yeah so so based on that we're like all right hey this is working out like you know let's make an app for this so we made, made like you know a simple feed just so we have a facebook feed like you know but it had like jokes and the celebrity gossip and news you know the kind of stuff that like you know people like to read right. the light light reading so we had that in english hindi and english and again we uh kind of acquired users in you know those parts where hindi and english is spoken mm-hmm. and yeah it, it didn't really take off and that's when, like, you know, again, when we tried figuring out, you know, why is this not taking off? I mean, there were a bunch of things wrong with that. So one was the fact that, like, you know, a lot of this content people are already getting on Facebook and WhatsApp. So, like, you know, when we later went out to malls and asked people, hey, see mm. this, like, you know, what do you think of it? They're like, mm, I think I already get this on Facebook and WhatsApp. So maybe the content was not good enough. And the second thing we realized is, you know, the kind of audience we were trying to target was so, so different from, like, you know, ourselves, the way what fun means for them, what their identity is for them, what their idea of fun is, that, you know, we were as foreign to that game as, you know, someone coming from outside India and, you know, kind of building for that. And and the WeChat of China vision that I, you know, joked about, like, like you know, China is a lot more homogeneous, I think, like, yeah. you know, than India. Yeah. So India winning every state would be like, you know, winning a new country. So it just seemed like, you know, much harder problem to solve mm-hmm. than we initially thought of. And by that time, again, we had another new angle that, you know, we came up with, which was like, you know what, when, when friends are chatting on WhatsApp, like, you know, they often, and we, we still had like, you know, some of that events app hangover mm-hmm. that you have to go to multiple apps to figure <laughs> out what to do. So we're like, all right, you know what, when friends are chatting, like, you know, they have to go to a Zomato to figure out, you know, what restaurant they want to go to or a book my show to, you know, figure out what movie. And often they're sharing YouTube videos, they're sharing songs and like, you know, a lot of conversations kind of flow around that. And that happens in real life as well, right? You know, you play mm-hmm. a song, you see a clip, and there's a lot of conversations that happen around that. So, like, all right, you know what? Why not bring all of these things together? Why not bring <laughs> these apps that, you know, people are already using within the chat itself? And, yeah, and, and again, like, you know, learning from our mistakes that, you know, hey, don't go build all of that. Right. Or So, so, so we, we made some designs and we went out to malls, talked to 40, 50, maybe even 100 people. And this time, like, you know, the response was fantastic. People are like, hey, must idea, it will go, it will go, I will say it, it will And they're like, yes, I will use it. We're like, all right, you know what, we've, we've hit it. Like, WeChat of China might might right. happen. And so, yeah, we went ahead and built it. WeChat of China. <laughs> 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 did not, did not happen. Did not happen. 
And yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff that we built as well. We tried building an e-commerce platform, but mm-hmm. for like, you know, the more creative sellers, because I mean, if you go to the typical e-commerce platform today, right. you can talk about the product a little bit, you can, you know, put up some photos, but the entire story behind, you know, why you created that, where you got that inspiration from, all of those stories do not really come out all that well. So we wanted to build an e-commerce platform where like, you know, where there could be more story-driven selling. Right. That didn't work out because, you know, I mean, to make an e-commerce platform, you have to make all the e-commerce the plumbing. features as well, yeah. all the plumbing yeah. and also all these sellers that we thought that, you know, will have the time to write the stories. I mean, they're very, very busy, much yes. busier than we thought and not necessarily the best storytellers either. <laughs> <laughs> but funny enough, this was, I mean, uh, this was pre-Geo, right? I mean, what you're talking about when you're trying to build WeChat of China. It's yeah. more than a few years ago. So, yeah. funnily enough, that this sort of an idea is now taking off with uh, what ShareChat is doing. Well, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. right? Uh, ShareChat is in like only Indian regional languages, 11 languages or so. And right. it's exactly this sort of a meme sharing platform and it's really taken off. But yeah, again, sure. that's taken off today probably because more and more exposure to the internet has happened. Right. And those people who told you at that time that I'm getting this from Facebook already, these are people who have just joined and they've not joined Facebook and they've joined uh, ShareChat instead, you know. So that sort of mobile first sort of audience right. in tier 2, 3, 4 has sort of started to emerge now uh, in India. So right. maybe it would have worked now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean, we often keep joking within the office that, you know, your idea was great. We just didn't have a billion users. So like <laughs> yeah. if, WhatsApp, if WhatsApp builds that today, I still think, you know, that problem is there except right. that you know people are already tired of like you know they've already gotten their friends on whatsapp and like exactly. you know a couple of other messaging exactly. apps they're not gonna convince someone else to you know download another, another messaging app for yeah. some right. i think and also i think that's the difference between share chat right i think one of the reasons why share chat worked as well is that they basically they facilitated sharing messages from there into whatsapp rather than having Correct. their own space where people were going to basically chat around that. So I think that kind of helped them yeah. a lot in that yeah, sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so a, we, we had that. We had that. Like, okay. So I mean, you had that feed and then the idea was, you know, you share that over WhatsApp and ah, that's okay, where the, okay. the virality was going to kick in ah, and we want to get okay, up billion okay. users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what these guys right, did. Yeah. But again, that so whole... So then, yeah, then it's a very similar product. So then it's a timing Yeah, yeah. Right? I did payments it was just two years before <laughs> demonetization. So it's all. We all get to say hindsight 2020 as they yes, say, right? Yes, but, yes, yes. But from there to back to... Uh, B two B SaaS, right? I mean, how do you think? Well, I guess how, that was the first step, right? The e-commerce thing that he was talking about, where they were trying to deal with sellers and trying to get them, give them more tools. So I guess that's B two B selling as well. That was B two B as well, uh, but it's still far away from like you know what we do today or what right. our strengths are. So I mean, after we built all of that, like you know, after finally building like you know ten products, we are like, all right, you know what? We're building a lot of these things. Where like you know, we come up with an idea today and we start building it tomorrow. Right, you know what, how about like we don't build something for, you know, a couple of months. Really just think about, you know, what went wrong with all of these things. Really understand what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, study the market, what's happening out there. And with the first exercise itself, like, you know, when we're trying to figure out what our strengths and weaknesses are, we realized, okay, hey, marketing SaaS is what we understand. We understand we have a brand over there. We have a customer base over there. Um, we know how to sell to these people. We know how to go to market, you know, for, for SaaS marketing products. So, and then we again looked at the market over there and then like, you know, there were some of these opportunities that we still thought like, you know, that still existed, even though marketing SaaS is a very, very crowded space. So, yeah, after after doing that in, entire exercise and like, you know, also till that point in time, like, you know, we had some kind of a strategy, but like, you know, never really thought deeply about it, never really like, you know, written it down on paper. So we did that entire, you know, company strategy exercise as well. And it was obvious that, you know, he this is a market that, you know, we can play in and we can win reasonably well. And yeah, that's when we went back to B2B uh, products. We went back to marketing SaaS and that's what we have been doing. For, like, you know, that's what my, my new product team has been doing for the last one year. And what kind of uh, products are these? I mean, uh, of course, you have a base to build on over here. But uh, where do you think uh, the opportunity lies on the business side? Yeah, if you don't want to get into specifics, just like high level, what, what your thoughts are? Sure, so... Um, I think I think both the products that we have up till now, like you know, that have been successful, VWO and the other product called Pushru, which is a web push notifications product. Mm-hmm. So both of them came at a time when you know both of these were new things. Like both of these were like kind of upcoming or emerging. So we realized that that's something that you know we're kind of good at. Mm-hmm. Like you know, taking something which is kind of upcoming or emerging. I mean, it's not very new that you know we have to kind of sit down, educate the market mm-hmm. for like you know two or three or four years. 
and only after three or four years when the entire market is ready will we be able to harvest that demand we want to enter space at a time like you now where we can build something and start making reasonable amounts of money today but it's not as crowded as say an email marketing or right. seo software so those are the spaces that we kind of excel in nice yeah yeah and again uh, since now i mean i'm new to the entire game of uh, market side and analytics side saas but i know there is this it's comparing again from a similar experience right moving from consumer side and trying to sell to the consumer and trying to get in the psyche of the consumer to uh, talking to business owners and people on the business side one thing which i remember you uh, which resonated with what you said right people come into work every day and then use the tool versus using it and uh, emotionally being very dependent mm-hmm. on it do you think uh, being able to sell a very structured business solving anything which has a direct relation to the amount of money uh, they are saving or they are or they are avoiding spending by using a tool like this do you think that's what makes selling a uh, business software easier versus consumer because i think consumers don't value uh, the need for i mean uh, a product that they use they don't compare it to how much money it's saving them or it's it's something that's not so easily translated there is no roi calculation on the consumer front. exactly <laughs> Is yeah. this something uh, you fit upon in uh, your trying to communicate the message of what you're selling? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's that's what I what I meant when like you know when I said that business buyers think about a decision a lot more rationally. They think it through a lot more than like you know consumer would. A consumer is would be like, "Ha, my friend ne bola, to use kar leta hu." It seemed like you know it's the right option to use, even though it might be the shittiest app to use. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I do think that happens. I mean, I wouldn't know about the cost saving side because I mean, both the products or even the products that we'll be making in the future are products that help businesses make more revenue. Correct. I mean, so either make, saving money or making money. Yeah, so making more revenue is an easier sell. I would think that you know course, saving money. Of course, of course. But, But it's money related. I mean, that ROI angle right. is there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah I would I would think so I mean for for Wingify that's true for me personally because I've been doing B2B all my life that's true I'm guessing someone who understands consumers has built consumer apps maybe they have a different story to tell mm-hmm. but yeah the rational versus irrational thinking I think still still kind of applies yeah and again on the B2B side right uh, what I've seen is uh, since you mentioned that your this emergent technology stuff depending on who in the company you're talking to again if you're talking to a marketer it's more about how much money uh, how much money they can make or how much the product will grow as a benefit of using this tool uh versus if you're talking to a developer uh who is who wants the latest and yeah. greatest sort of stuff uh i have a question th- which around how when you uh, how do you set expectations of what your tool can do uh to the people you talk to because uh while a lot of tools are out there in the market which are very specific hmm. and only the ones which are specific do a really good job of that one thing that they do really well right whereas more and more i see uh people who have who want a whole bouquet of like oh i want a one stop shop uh that solves everything for me and this happens more as you go up the enterprise ladder do you see uh this sort of a challenge uh, coming around Hmm. So we've been selling to SMB in the mid market up till now. Mm-hmm. We've not really sold to a lot of enterprises, so I'm not really sure how that will play out for us. Uh-huh. But uh, and again, like you know, the way we've started off is like you know doing one feature, building like you know what we call a point solution, and then building on top of it. So that's not really been a challenge for us. Like you know, build this one thing that the market really, really needs. Get the messaging right. It will take like you know a couple of iterations, you know, for you to really explain what you've built. but yeah that's that's what we've done that's what has worked well for us so that's not really been a challenge for us right but again these are all very technical sales right when you just mentioned getting the messaging right getting the messaging right for a very fine point b2b like a small uh, solution how do you do that i mean how do you, how does one uh, get the messaging right because it's such a niche audience you're going after versus a bouquet or whatever right everyone like okay funny thing is the more enterprise uh, you go i see other websites having being so generic about what they do that it just makes no sense right. like it, they they have a picture of oh i live a great life and it's actually a saas tool for some <laughs> accounting or something like that like <laughs> so what do you mean by getting the messaging right uh in your experience since you've done marketing i mean could you give me some insights on that sure so let's say when we started off with push crew like you know what it helps you do is send push notifications 
and a great use case of that is like you know when e-commerce companies are running discounts or offers like you know you don't want to send that on email because one email open rates have really really gone down over time and secondly when you have something like you know that is that's only going to last for like you know 24 hours the chances of that getting opened on email right within 24 hours so much lesser as opposed to you know a web push notification going out mm-hmm. so we just say hey send push notifications that get opened in time i mean this is a very crude version the right. the right. marketers do a better job right. of it right. but uh, yeah we see something like you know send push notifications that you know will get opened as a post you know email which will only have 20% open rate and people will open much later on so something on those lines done done better hmm. right so basically get the again this is solving for that problem right the problem which most people face uh, making sure the message communicates how your product solves that exact problem is that what it is is that essentially yeah, what it is that's how i mean yeah when you, when you're just starting off uh, you know it's a new channel you got to be very very specific and that's a pain point that you know people have been facing email open rates have been going down so they feel that exact specific pain point and they you know they kind of they kind of you know associate with it it resonates with them so yeah it works for it works for us awesome where where do you see the overall market going so since you mentioned on email uh how come email is still around like is it email is still around uh, as in the fact that these email uh, sort of services uh, SaaS products and email uh, are still so huge I mean it's still Mm -hmm. a very large massive opportunity out there which people like all these large email companies run on right Uh, do you foresee that still being the primary channel uh, even though open rates are so abysmal yeah I would think so yeah I still think, I mean, I don't see email going away any time in the near future. Yeah, and I think, uh, so I, I think one thing that has helped email become even, I, I think it's become stronger now than it was five, seven, ten years ago. Spam is more or less solved today, right? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you don't get spam in your inbox, right? So as a marketing tool, uh, the open rate uh, that you would expect, it would take time, right? It doesn't happen immediately. But I think over time, the open rates will start kicking back Coming up. Coming back, yeah. Because, I mean, if, if you don't, the, why did I not open all this email? I was getting? Because I was getting so much crappy email all the time, right? Now, Google puts all of my update stuff in the updates column. Right, so I just have to go to the updates once in a while, and I'll see what's in there. Go into the social thing once in a while, see what's in there. Go into the subscriptions thing once in a while, and see what's in there. Right, so I mean, like, it won't happen immediately, but I think that the open rates in that kind of context will start going up again. Yeah, and the other thing with email, I mean, people talk about like you know social media and a lot of these other things, but I think with an email, you have your full attention over there. Sure, marketing emails might not get those kind of open rates. But if something that's, you know, relevant to you, if it's something that's important to you, it will get a lot more attention than, you know, most other channels would. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and official is email, right? I mean, but, if I need to communicate from my company or somebody else's company, email is the official way to do that. Yeah, yeah unless unless you're in China, yeah. where, where it's WeChat. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I, you know, I mean, like, I don't see uh, that happening over here, really. I think uh, it's been tough enough to get people to move from post to fax to email. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh I don't see, uh, because, because, you know, I mean, also chat feels casual to me in a way that email does not. Email feels more formal to me. Now, again, this might just be 40-year-old guy talking, but uh, it does feel like that to me. Yeah, I, I I mean, I don't know. I don't have a very strong opinion on that. I mean, there are, there are like, you know, a lot of youngsters for whom, like, you know, chat might be, like, you know, that's the yeah. way they've grown up. We have grown mm-hmm. up with email as the yeah. official announcement or the official communication channel. So I'm not completely sure about that. But what I do know is like, you know, at least for the near next four, five, six years, I still see email being very important. Very, very. Relevant, and there are, yeah. there are like, you know, interesting things happening with email as well, right? I don't know if you guys have seen the interactive email or the AMP email that Google came up with, oh. where, you know, if, if like, you know, you sent uh, an email and like, you know, you have to make like a booking or something like, you know, all of that can be done within the email itself. Mm. You don't have to go to a yeah, separate yeah, web page. Yeah. And I think that will open up I like a ton of possibilities. Really I think there are some other interesting things that are happening in email, right? So like one is, uh, so somebody on a Slack channel posted this article about uh, how uh, people are applying AI solutions to email. So basically they, you, you sign up with your email and they go through your entire email this. And then basis what you kind of are yeah. regularly doing, it they will kind of just fulfill that. The other thing I saw, which was really interesting, which I'm going to implement, and all of the people who work for me are going to hate, is uh, there is a uh, company out of the UK which won some awards and stuff like that recently. And they're doing uh, deep uh, analysis of who's working and who's not working by <laughs> checking out email and seeing who is accessing files they should not be accessing on Google Drive. And, like, you know, they're doing all this kind of stuff. And I think I want to put that in place as well. Awesome. 
Yeah. Awesome. I want to be the, you know, spying guy. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, I'm going to change this to a, a lighter note uh, because this has been a question uh, since you've told me about your story of moving around cities. How are you finding Pune, man, to build uh, SaaS products? I and I'm coming as to you as a person who's building SaaS out of uh, Bombay, which itself is rare. So, what do you think is your take on uh, the your own team side and the strengths of uh, being able to run out of a place like Pune and the dev scene and general awareness about SaaS uh, building SaaS products in mm-hmm. our country. So personally I mean I like Pune uh, and and the reason like you know I mentioned that we had the option of going to either Bangalore or Pune and we chose Pune because I mean two two and a half three years back when I mean that time like you no know, Bangalore the entire scene was like you know just so much happening so much money coming in e-commerce was still hot mm-hmm. like it was still growing everyone thought like you know I mean this going to be like billion dollar companies yeah. all over bangalore so that was happening but bangalore also had like a lot of distractions uh, there are so many events happening people are talking about like you know, here here's the next thing here's the next thing um, you know people want like their salaries to double every 6 months <laughs> yeah. yeah they're like alright i got a new offer so there's there's like a lot of distractions in bangalore uh, so that way like you know pune was nice that like you know I mean, there are some things happening, but like you know, all of those distractions are cut out. Pune kind of like you know feels like a sister city of Bangalore to me. The weather is nice. It's decently cosmopolitan because you know there are there are students from all over. Right. And the other reason why we wanted to open an office is because a lot of people from South India are not willing to you know move all the way to Delhi. They <laughs> do not like you know like me, like you know they do not associate themselves with Delhi or do not see themselves being in Delhi. Right. And yeah, I guess I guess they have the reasons. So yeah, that way that way Pune is nice. but definitely pune does not have like anything even close to like you know the kind of scene that you know bangalore has or even a delhi has i'm not sure what the bombay scene is but uh, yeah the pune tech scene is is fairly small right. i mean i go to events and i'm meeting the same people over and over again i've kind of got stopped going to them so like you know when i want that you know that that shot of energy i go to like a bangalore i go outside india you know to attend an event or two right so yeah pune does not have that happening but if you just want to sit down build quietly be in a nice city have nice people around uh, and still have a good time like you know pune has fun places to go to i think yeah. i think that way pune is pretty nice mm-hmm. yeah man it should be interesting let's <laughs> let's hope let's hope there are more genuine uh, startup hubs like this inst- and it doesn't become a bangalore uh, anytime soon <laughs> that's the <laughs> hope <laughs> but you and, know i think people are going to start uh, a lot of people are going to start making companies outside of bangalore man because this uh, people jumping around is a problem right i mean yeah. like for people over there so i mean uh, you move to a different city chances are that it'll be tougher to attract people but the people will stay i think a little easier that's the hope yeah. uh, we're building out of goregaon <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> making sure no one comes there to steal our engineers <laughs> But awesome, Sanket. Thanks so much uh, for doing this. And uh, any closing thoughts on uh, where SaaS is going, or wh- where do you see uh, India build products like this, such as Wingify, and a whole bunch of, of very few, I would say, who have really made it right. I mean, there's not so much of a SaaS culture in the country. But do you see this uh, increasing? I mean, you've been on this on the B two B SaaS side for a while now. You've seen all the other products in the market as well. What you, what's your closing thoughts? So my my thoughts are pretty similar to like you know what a lot of other people have said like you know so on the pro, on the development side like you know India has good talent we are able to build products, but like I see a lot of startups who have absolutely no idea of like you know how to go to market and that's why like you know most Indian SaaS startups fail, and I also think that a lot of them like you know focus on you know selling to Indian customers, and I I, I don't recommend that at all. It's <laughs> they're going to ask you for the moon they're going to ask you for features that they will not even use in the next 5 years right. or ever they're going to pay you pennies they'll want to call you at like you know two in the night when something breaks uh, okay i'm painting a very bad picture of the indian <laughs> customer maybe it's not as bad as that but i you think know, we've I, all dealt with indian customers <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think i think you know starting with indian customers is in most cases not the best idea like you know start globally or start with the us or whatever the best market is so yeah i think i think indians are building pretty good products the go to market side is what they'll have to figure out and focusing on the indian market according to me is not the best idea right but i mean if if companies can get this right and i'm hopeful like you know at least we have been able to realize the mistakes people are talking you know talking about these mistakes so i think you know they will figure out how to solve for these as well awesome great thanks so much for doing this thanks for making uh, time out on uh, this uh, weekend that you're here in bombay uh, and uh, hope to catch you around uh, in pune maybe yeah that okay. to be here this was fun So, how do people get in touch with you on uh, Twitter? 
So I'm, I'm on Twitter as Sankit Nadhani, S N K T N A D H A N I. Yep, and you're also on our Slack channel already. So yes, you have yes. joined it early, and yeah. everybody else, please join if you haven't. Be interactive. Talk to us about what you thought of the episode, and uh, also please uh, go to the iTunes Store or wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a rating, give us a review. That stuff really helps to kind of get the word out. And also, uh, kind uh, please do uh, follow us on the IVM Podcast uh, Twitter handle and use the hashtag Shuni One if you want to interact with us on Twitter. Yep, and uh, lately I've been thinking about doing a Shunya coin. <laughs> <laughs> we should get that going. Which, which, which we will hope to launch soon. <laughs> we will get that going. <laughs> But maybe that maybe that'll happen. Thank, thanks so much for being with us, Ankit. It was a All great right, show. Thank you. He bends down to test the warm water for his bath. He comes here to quench his thirst for a hot shower and some podcasts. You can witness how he enjoys having other people talk about cool stuff in his bathroom. Indeed, it helps him with his loneliness. You can find more of his pieces on ivmpodcast.com, your one-stop destination where you can check out the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.